Hey guys, I'm Clint Pascal, lead pastor of The Waters Church. The Waters Church, what is The Waters Church? Guys, we're a church where you don't have to hide your tattoos, where the pastors aren't that impressed with themselves, and where you don't have to pretend to be better than you really are. So here you are, you're checking out one of our messages. Guys, these messages are based on biblical truth. Don't ever take any of our word for it. Do your own stuff. Do your own testing. This is biblical stuff and truth that will lead your heart to freedom. And our goal here is always the same, just to push people a little closer and closer to Jesus Christ. And man, the closer you get to him, the more free your heart's going to be. Hey, thanks so much for checking us out. I just had a guy grab me uh, as he was walking out to get something. He just said, hey, I just did the online giving thing. I've been going to churches for a long time, but this is the first time in 31 years that I've ever tithed to a church in my life. And he got excited about the concept of giving. You know that you are getting affected by the Holy Spirit when you do something as weird as give your money to a church. You know, you're like, whoa, a lot of people out there that would question my sanity. And this is when you start to sort of get the concept of living with hands open. I pray God's continual blessing on that guy and all of us as we live our lives with hands open just to see what God's going to do next. We are in the midst of counterculture. And if you've been paying attention at all, you know that that tagline, Jesus challenges the status quo. That status quo is talking about the status quo of the church. So Jesus came to counter a culture that was alive and well within the church. And there's no, there's no more perfect story that captures what I've been talking about and will talk about today and tomorrow and we're done. I mean tomorrow, uh, next week. We'll be done with this series after next week. But there's no more perfect story than in John chapter 8, the woman caught in adultery. And in the story of the woman caught in adultery, you have this situation where this person, it was clearly a trap. This woman was set up. She was dragged out in the midst of her sin, lay down at the feet of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees looked at her and said, shame, shame, shame. She should die for this sin of sexual immorality. Jesus looks at them and he goes, fine, if you have never sinned before, not if you've never committed the sin of adultery, but if you've never sinned before, by all means, kill her. Here's the thing. In that story, if I was to ask you, which one of those two do you relate with the most? Would it be the woman caught in adultery or the Pharisees? Now, be careful. It's a trick question. If somebody asked me, hey, Clint, which do you relate to the most, the woman caught in adultery or the Pharisees, I would have to very honestly answer that by saying both. The woman caught in adultery is me. It's my life. It is the the recognition that I am broken, that I am sinful, and I am exposed. It's pretty simple to identify with that, but here's the problem. I've also many times in my life struggled with the idea of relating to the Pharisees. The Pharisees looked at a person that they said, you are not acceptable. You do things that are outside the bounds of what we should be doing. You need to be taken out. These Pharisees thought they were doing the right thing. Many of us, we wake up in the kingdom of God, going to church, praying our prayers, giving our resources, and we think that we're doing the right thing, but we can accidentally slip into the culture of the Pharisees, which is exactly the culture Jesus came to counter. And I will confess to you, sometimes I deal with that, that judgmental spirit, that arrogance, that strictness, that legalism. I look at a person, I think to myself, maybe that's beyond the bounds, maybe that's something that should be done, that person should be taken out. And then I can hear the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Let's think that one through, dude. The Pharisees set a trap and a culture for all of us in the kingdom of God to slip into. Have you slipped into the Pharisee culture? Do you think that you are better than? Do you think that there are certain people that are outside the boundaries of lovely? Are there comfortable situations where you say, that is my mission field to enter into the spaces that I know very well? This is, this, this is the culture of the Pharisees. And today what I want to do is I want to dial in on a specific thing about the Pharisees. And I need to say something to Current, and I don't know if there's a single member of Current in here. I think I see one over here. Current needs to know that I might not be finished with you today. You might need to be ready. Uh, This is one of those deals. I get prayed for every single Sunday morning before my sermon, because half the time I don't know what's gonna happen, what the Holy Spirit's gonna do, and I'm confessing to you right now, I don't really know how this service is gonna end, okay? That's a great look on a leader. I have no idea where we're going. Would you join me? Would you follow me? Current needs to know that I might not be finished with you. That probably needs to get out of this room to some other people. Otherwise, just the ones that are in here are just going to be called up on stage possibly in a minute. Good move. Uh, Thank you, my friend. 
So the, 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 the situation of the Pharisees that I'm going to dial in on has to do with the word worship, worship, worship. What is this thing and why do we do it? Worship. Why do we do it? Worship. What is worship? Worship is your response to the glory, the grace, the love, the leadership, the existence of God himself. It is how you respond to him. So therefore you have to ask the question, how is my worship? What does my worship look like? How does this work? So in Isaiah chapter six, Isaiah, one of the major prophets of the old Testament, a book in the old Testament, that's a pretty big deal. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter six, Isaiah comes into contact with God in the temple and he is blown away by what he sees. He is literally undone. He sees the Lord lifted high Lift it up. And then he hears angels calling out to one another with urgency, with excitement. And here's what the angel said. Holy is the Lord. The earth is full of his glory. And this is what, I, this is what Isaiah witnesses. He sees angels calling to one another. Holy is the Lord. And the other angels respond with, the earth is full of his glory. And, and Isaiah just watches this. What is this? Doesn't it feel like a pep rally? Now, it's not so much we have spirit. Yes, we do. But there is something to it that is a bit like a pep rally. He just sits there for a moment. I don't know how long. And watches these angels. Holy is the Lord. The earth is full of his glory. The angels serve as a bit of an example for us. So let's follow. Everybody on this side of the room, I want you to give me your best. Holy is the Lord. Your best. And in a minute, I want this side of the room to give me your best. The earth, yours is longer the earth is full of his glory. This is what the angels did. This is Isaiah witnessing worship on a heavenly realm. What is your line? Holy is the Lord. All right, ready? On the count of three, I want you to give me your best. Holy is the Lord. One, two, three. Holy is the Lord. Was... Wow. Some of you are more wow than others. Wow. Impressive. And see, they were like one of the angels. They're calling out. Now this side, what is your line? All right, on the count of three, give me your best. The earth is full of his glory. One, two, three. The earth is full of his glory. All right. Stand up, everybody in this other room, stand up. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to imagine that moment in the temple when Isaiah witnessed the angel saying this worshipful response, holy is the Lord. You don't have to scream it, but I am looking for heart and passion. One, two, three. Now, everybody on this side, stand up. I want you to close your eyes. This isn't a competition. It's coming from your heart. It's an activation of your worship zone, this part of your heart that can't help but respond. The earth is full of his glory. One, two, three. Now I want us to switch. I want you guys to say, holy is the Lord. One, two, three. And the earth is full of his glory. Ready? One, two, three. I want everybody together to say, just holy is the Lord. One, two, three, together. Holy is the Lord. Do that again. One, two, three. Holy is the Lord. Even in this room, there's an echo. With your eyes closed, the earth is full of his glory. One, two, three. Worship is our response to the glory, the majesty, the very existence of God. Y'all may be seated. The concept of responding is worship. It is what it is to respond. It is coming from your gut. The response. What happened next? Well, Isaiah, as some of you literally in this moment might also be thinking about, thought about his own sin. That's very normal. Many times the human response to worship is, God, you are amazing. I suck. And this is exactly what Isaiah did. God, you are incredible. Oh, don't look at me. I will praise you behind a brick wall or lead because Superman can't see lead. Behind, but, but he can't see through lead. That made no sense. To him. Just, I'm going to be hidden. But what happens next is that Isaiah is like, don't look at me. I am awful. And then through an angel, God cleanses the sin of Isaiah with this really bizarre thing, hot coals. We have some hot coals. Would you go ahead and bring those in? Just kidding. We're not doing that. There was this hot coal that was just barely touched to his lips. Woohoo! That'll wake you up. 
And it was this concept of being cleansed. And then what happened to Isaiah? Isaiah responds with a life commitment. I am right here. And whatever it is you're looking for me to do, send me. Look at me. Send me. Woo, that's a dangerous thing to do in the presence of God. Wave him down. Hey, 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 look at me. Send me. The Lord's like, <laughs> okay. Hang on, brother, sister. What is your worship like? How emotional are you? With it. What's your hype like? Or, or how, what's your worship like right now in this room, in this very moment? Are you like a thousand miles away thinking about something else? Distracted? God is so active in the world. He is so active. He's so active around you. Are you connecting with him? And are these questions just unfamiliar? I just don't know what that means. Have you ever been to a sporting event or a play or a movie and you're there, you're, you are there excited about what's happening, what you're watching, and you're there with people and they're completely disengaged? You ever had this moment before? And you look at these people that are not engaged and you're like, what is wrong with you? Do you not know how amazing this is? What is your problem? To me, it all goes back to Monster Jam. <laughs> I don't know why you just laughed. Because Monster Jam is important. Every single year since Cade was like seven or six, I've taken him to Monster Jam. Every year. We made a promise to one another we'll go to Monster Jam for the rest of our lives. To the glory of God the Father. And we go to this redneck bonanza fiesta parade. It's a thing to behold. And every year, Cade has brought a friend. And it usually goes well, but oh, Kate, and I will never forget. This one year when he brought a friend, and at the height of Monster Jam, and Kate and I are just losing our minds, screaming, we look over, and his friend is all folded up in the chair, playing on his phone. <laughs> Kate elbows me, Dad, what is going on? I mean, but guys, we're talking about this. I don't know, again, why you're laughing. This is a moment of glory. That truck weighs like 12,000 pounds. It's like 40 feet in the air. It's like, it'll, it'll transcend your soul to another dimension when you go to these events. And this dude's playing on his phone. And Cade is mad. He's like, dad. I was like, I know, dude. Not everybody is enlightened. Not everybody understands. It was like, and it really jacked with Cade for the whole thing. I was like, dude, you cannot let them bring you down. <laughs> oh, gee. All right. I wonder if we're the only church in America that's using Monster Jam as an example of praise and worship. It's sad if we are. So Jesus counters the culture of disengaged worship. He does it constantly, of apathetic worship, of heartless worship. Guys, here's the problem with church. Way too many people come to church because they want to get fed, and way too few people come to church to worship. I'm here because I want to be fed. Why'd you stop going to that church? Because that preacher didn't feed me. Way too many of us go to church to get fed, and way too few of us go to church to worship. Gathering together in the name of Jesus Christ as a holy assembly is so much more about worship than it is about you being spiritually fed. Proverbs 13, and I know Proverbs 13 culture is actually talking about a personal ambition and accountability, and it's actually talking about finance, but in Proverbs 13, Solomon says something pretty intense. He said, the righteous will feast until their bellies are full, but the wicked will die of starvation. And I know it's a bit of a theological mangle for me to attach that to, to worship, but I have attached that to worship ever since I read that because I was convicted of it myself because I used to be one of the people that said, I will go to a church so long as I get fed. And then I read the Bible. The righteous will feed themselves. The righteous will feed themselves. Let me say it this way, Dice, to you. I love being your pastor, but it is not my job to feed you. It is my job to lead you in worship. Worship. If you literally come here to get fed, wow, you must be hungry. You must really be hungry. Because that means that you won't eat again spiritually until next Sunday. And you know what ha might happen next Sunday? You might wake up in a bad mood or with a fever. And you might miss next Sunday. And then somebody might come in town and you might miss the next Sunday. And it could be a month. It is never the job of the preacher to feed. The concept is to lead in worship. Way too few of us go to church with the idea in our mind to actually 
worship. Now, leadership on a personal basis has a lot to do with feeding. I meet with a lot of you guys personally. We have a lot of personal meetings. I meet with so many of you guys. And at that, I absolutely adopt the command that Jesus gave to, feed, to Peter to feed his sheep. But so much of that happens on a personal relational level. And let's be honest, you come to church to worship and will you get fed? Yeah, you'll get fed. But you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that tendency for our heart to sit back and say, I am here for a show and it better be good. Well, hopefully you are worshiping God and hopefully you are doing it the way he wants you to. Luckily for us, we don't have to guess because God tells us how to. So for the rest of this message that we're doing right now, for the rest of this time that we're together, switch your brain and be here to worship as you learn what worship is. The Hebrew word, the Old Testament word for worship is shacha, to bow down, to be in reverence or to stoop. This is the Hebrew Old Testament concept of worship. The very first mention of this word is in Genesis 18, when three men, one of them the Son of God, you can look in that story later in Genesis 18, come to Abraham. There's a declaration that his wife is about to get pregnant, even in old age. This is before the destruction of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. These three men, and Abraham's response is shaka to bow down, to be reverent, which was a good response because one of them, as you read the story, you will see is what we call a Christophany or an example of Christ showing up in the Old Testament. In Psalm chapter five, the word is used again. David says, but I, by your great love, can come into your house in reverence. I, by, I bow down toward your holy temple. He says in Psalm 29, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, worship the Lord in splendor of his holiness. In Nehemiah chapter 8, the Bible says that Ezra called out and blessed the eternal, worshiping God's greatness with their hands raised to the heavens. Hands raised in worship, guys, is an Old Testament thing as well. They called out loudly in response, crying, amen, so may it be. So much passion, so much excitement, so much cheering. Then they fell to their knees and bowed with their faces to the ground. They worshiped the eternal. That is the Old Testament hype when it comes to worship. And then we have the New Testament. The Greek word for worship is quite a word, proskuneo, the kiss of a dog into the hand of his master. Yes, that's what it means. The kiss of a dog on the hand of its master. And in, in the New Testament, you see much of this happening. The very first reference of worship in the New Testament is when the wise men came to worship in Matthew chapter two, proskuneo. These wise men are like, can we have that opportunity to have that sort of emotional response to that baby? And then Matthew 14, those who were in the boat, his disciples, they worshiped him and they said, truly you are the son of God. That worship word, proskuneo, excitement leaning in with excitement, eyebrows up, energy up, countenance in, leaning in. What are you going to do next, God? And all that you've done, I'm excited about it and I want to praise you for it. Check out this one in 1 Corinthians. Unbelievers are affected by worship and prophecy in the church because all their secrets are laid bare. They fall down and worship God, proclaiming God is really among you. Did you see that? That is an unbeliever's response. A person who is spiritually not a Christian worships God because of what they see in the behavior and worship response of believers. In Revelation 11, the 24 elders, 24 elders, that's always a way of categorizing the whole earth, all nations, who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and they worshiped God. All of this stuff, all of this worship 101 has a deep and passion to it. It has heart. It has intense engagement. It is the culture of disengagement that Jesus came to counter. Remember, all of this is a response to what God has done. Worship is how you respond to God. And I can't help but think about Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene is this unbelievable story in the New Testament where a woman some people think the New Testament is made up. If it was made up, that would never be the story. It would have been a man because this woman put the men to shame. And this woman showed up, Mary Magdalene, Mary from Magda Magdala, and she showed up and she saw, she found out that Jesus was alive. And her worship response, I think, is really captured in this picture. This was taken uh, 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Within the last 2,000 years? She lay, yes, in color, shut up. That amazing things back then. 
believe in miracles, my friend. She left that place and she went back to where the disciples were and threw off their covers. Wake up, you lazy slugs. You people living in fear. What is your problem? Jesus is alive. And they were like, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> what is your problem? <laughs> Pipe down, zealot, you woman. Oh, now it's on. And she is the first. It's unbelievable. Her worship response leads the disciples then to lean in to make clear the counter culture to the disengaged worship, to make that point clear, look no further than Luke 19. Oh, this story is intense. They brought a colt to Jesus. They threw their coats on the colt's back. They sat on it. And as Jesus rode along, some people began to spread their garments on the road like a carpet. When they passed the crest of Mount Olivet, they began descending toward Jerusalem. A huge crowd of disciples began to celebrate and praise God with loud shouts, glorifying God for the mighty works that they had witnessed. They said, the king who comes in the name of the eternal one is blessed. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Here's the Pharisees' response. Teacher, tell these people to stop making these wild claims and acting this way. Jesus said, listen, if they were silent, the very rocks would start to shout. I don't read from the message that often. It is a paraphrase, but look at how the message captures this. Some Pharisees from the crowd told him, teacher, get your disciples under control. But he said, if they kept quiet, the stones would do it for them, shouting praise. The King James Version of the Bible says, and some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said to them, I tell you that if they should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. This is amazing to me because Psalm 150, the last of the Psalms, says that everything that has breath, praise the Lord, apparently rocks have breath. I didn't know that. But apparently in a moment where we are silent, I guess if there could be a moment in human history, I'd kind of like to pull off this social uh, experiment where every single human on the planet for a moment stops praising God just for a minute and standing next to a rock and sees what happens. Everybody, one, two, three, stop. <laughs> Jesus looks at the culture of the Pharisees, worship, stale, somber, closed off event for the heart. And they were furious at what they saw. What is it the disciple, I'm sorry, what is it that the Pharisees saw that they hated so much? They saw that. That's what they saw. That is God and you are the dog. They saw that. The excitement of a puppy saying, I love you. They saw that. Wow. Took up the whole face. And sometimes God might not know what to think about it. <laughs> but this is the perfect capturing of the word proskuneo. And the Pharisees saw it and they said, that is out of order. Tell them to stop. And Jesus said, you tell them. I'm not telling them. If, if we tell them then, and they stop, then apparently a rock band's going to start playing. Hey, you got a problem with that? Take that up with the Holy Spirit. But he's put that on my heart. It's not funny. It's, pro it's deeply profound. And I expect it to be posted on social media. <laughs> and my question to our church is this. How, how is our worship? What's our worship like here? How did the disciples worship? What about the Roman centurion? who at the point of the death of the Son of God makes a declaration as a pagan, we assume, surely he was the Son of God. What about the parents of the little girl that Jesus raised from the dead? How would you worship, parents, if your little girl died and Jesus came and her heart started beating again? How would you worship? How would you worship the way you are right now? Or would you find a new gear? What about the, the man who was paralyzed? What about the blind man? What about the demon possessed man? What about the one healed from leprosy? How, how did they worship? And what about the woman caught in adultery? When she is released from condemnation, 
What did her worship look like? Do you understand that the church, the, the fame of Jesus Christ rides on the backs of stories like this? Because it is people like this that go out into their community and they say, hmm, I have to tell you what Jesus has done. I have to praise him. I can't not worship. We desperately as the Waters Church need to be a church that comes together for worship. And I will challenge the culture of the worship at our church. I would challenge it. First, I'm looking in the mirror at me, the one who confessed to you that I tend to side with the Pharisees. I don't get it right. May we respond to the glory, the grace, the love, the life, the leadership, the very existence of God with worship. May our hearts be revived spiritually, emotionally, and may we worship in a way, by the way, this is the story of my wife's salvation, how she actually got saved by witnessing the worship of Christians when she was lost. And see, she said, there must be something to this. I get it that life is hard. I'm in the middle of a very hard life myself. I get it that life can sometimes feel hopeless. I get it that you can also ask questions like, where is God and why won't he answer my prayers? All of that is where Jesus says, worship me in spirit and in truth. In other words, honesty. But there also is a grand sweeping story of all that God has done for you. Is that worth your hype? Is it? Is it worth us to get emotionally and spiritually involved? Current, I'm gonna ask you to come back up. And current, I'm going to put this on you. I don't know what song you're going to sing. I don't know what you're going to do. But I would ask that you lead us in some sort of a musical experience that gives all of us an opportunity for shakha and proskuneo. Shakha, the concept of I bow in reverence to God. That is accurate, proper worship. And proskuneo this adoption of an excited puppy. All of it feels unorthodox. And isn't that why the Pharisee said, stop? Are you worshiping according to Pharisee culture? Or are you worshiping according to Jesus Christ culture and command? The very thing he said, stop doing. I'm sorry, the very, very thing that the Pharisees told him to stop doing is the very thing he wants us to do. Holy is the Lord. The earth is full of his glory. That includes this auditorium in Katy, Texas. How might we respond in worship? What does it look like? That's your business. That's between you and the Lord. I don't care. Nobody cares. It's a condition of your heart. Let's worship the Lord. And the conclusion of this worship moment, we will remain standing. Prayer team will be at the back and we will respond with Isaiah style commitment. But for now, Christ countered disengaged worship, worship engaged church family. Let's stand to our feet.